last week, um, we began with Ephesus, uh, the careless church. They were busy for the Lord, but they have lost why they were doing what they were doing. And so they went through the motions, but they just didn't, they really didn't care anymore. And then we looked at Smyrna, and we called Smyrna the crowned church. Uh, but it was a church that was called to suffer. And we talked about our brothers and sisters around the planet that are suffering today. On Tuesday, I received this email I'm going to read to you from, uh, from Dr. Pat Melanson, who leads our Baptist Global Response Ministry for the Southern Baptist Convention. Pat has been here on multiple occasions at our mission conferences, and we have done international disaster relief trips with him. Wanda has, and Mick, and others from our congregation have gone internationally. And he sent me this uh, in response to him. Uh, in an early morning raid on October 9, 2018, over 70 Pakistani Christians seeking asylum in Bangkok were arrested for overstaying their visas. Most of them had fled their homes in Pakistan over six years ago when the persecution of Christians had reached an unbearable level. They sold whatever they could, purchased visas and airfare to the only country that was an option for them, Thailand. After arriving in Bangkok, they, saw, they sought legal recognition as asylum seekers through, and it's a big pronunciation of, of uh, an organization, six years of processing their requests, and the UN has denied their cases, but the families have continued holding out for any possibility of resettlement to another country. They want to live in a country where they might have the freedom to worship Jesus without the fear of bombing, fire, or their wives and children being raped by the zealous Muslim majority in their home country, which that had happened to many of these 70. The legal system in the Islamic Republic of Pakistan does not give Christian minorities any legal recourse from discrimination or protection from persecution. The Christians have believed that they're returning to their home country, which means certain death or further persecution at the very least. Everett and Lori Miller have worked for a year and a half to establish an underground English learning center among this very group who were arrested. The Pakistani refugee teachers that have equipped to lead a group of students was arrested along with all of the children that they teach. Over 30 children from one apartment building ranging in age 2 to 18 are now incarcerated in the infamous and overcrowded immigration detention center along with their parents. The Thai immigration police are pressuring these detainees and assuring them that their only option is deportation. Given the hopelessness of their current situation, all the families are now begging to return to Pakistan rather than waste away and watch their children die and be raped in prison. We are trying to resist these families, uh, assist these families rather in providing airfare for them and their children to return to Pakistan. Our hope is that God is going to do something much bigger than we're able to ask or imagine. This group of Pakistani Christians has been equipped to share their faith through Bible stories. They have passed through the fire and have had their faith strengthened by perseverance in times of trouble. We see this as a commissioning of missionary workers being sent to the harvest field. Our heartfelt belief is that the seeds of the gospel which have been sown into these families will bear lasting fruit in one of the most difficult and least reached countries in the world. Father, we stop for a moment and realize, uh, Lord, I, I just say it again, I am a spoiled American. And Lord, I pray for my Pakistani brothers and sisters right now. And Lord, I, I pray, Father, I, they do not know what will await them. At best, persecution. At its worst, their deaths. But Lord, they're, they're, they're as Pat said, they're going to be sent as missionaries. They are, they are out of options, Holy Spirit, unless you move. You, God, you are the God that is sovereign, and you are the God that controls, and you're the God that moves. So touch and move. I pray for your hand of protection. I cannot even begin to speak. Uh, think of the, and, and it just, it, man, I can't hardly even read what has happened to these children. What has happened to the ladies? Lord Jesus, I, again, I ask you to deliver. I ask you to use them. But, Lord, you, you told the church at Smyrna to be faithful unto death. And, Lord, this, it didn't get much more real than what we got right here. 
So, Father, would you, would you be with them? You, you never promised we wouldn't go through the valley of the shadow of death. You never promised it. But you promised to be on the other side waiting. Be with our Pakistani brothers and sisters, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Revelation chapter 2, we begin our study in the third church. Uh, it was really kind of cool this week, by the way, while you're turning there. Beginning in verses uh, 12 through 17, uh, the, the uh, last night, that um, last day that uh, Greg and, and Brian, or Brent was with us from Life Action Ministries, uh, they came in, Brent sat in my, or uh, Greg sat in my office with me. He said, now, Pastor, I want to give you a couple of books um, recommended follow-up from the conference, and I want to give these to you, and I want to kind of walk through them with you if you don't care, because we've just seen if you kind of do these things, it, it continues the, what's been taking place for the last four days. And he said, so here is my, my, our first and strongest suggestion to you. We strongly recommend that you preach a series of messages from Revelation 2 and 3 on the seven churches in Revelation call God as my witness. And I just kind of smiled and said, yeah, I think we can handle that one. That, that one would be all right. And, uh, and so, and we just kind of walked through some further things, but it was just, nobody can orchestrate that but the Holy Spirit, folks. Nobody can. I ain't that good. Nobody's that good. I didn't know what they were going to talk about when they got here. I knew we were going to talk about revival, but I had no idea. He would sit down in my office and say, we recommend you kind of look at these seven churches so you can, people can identify what your, where your church is in the process, but not only just an institution, a church is just a thing of bricks and stones. The church is you guys and me. Where am I at in these seven churches? Have I left my first love? Has God called on me to suffer and to do that well for him? Or as we see in this church here, uh, the state of many churches in the United States of America. This week and next week, we've got Pergamos and we got Thyatira, okay? Uh, these, are, these churches are dominant in the United States of America today. Now, let me say it again. These two dominate the churches of the United States of America today. So, we, want to, we got to figure out what are they and what are they doing in, um, in your notes there, this week we will continue our study. Our third church is called Pergamos, and I call it the Compromising Church. All right, Pergamos is going to be bad. Next week, Thyatira is the corrupt church. So these two churches exist in America today, and they are the dominant characteristics of the church today. So what are they? In chapter, 12, verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 12, and to the angel... This is the pastor teacher of the church in Pergamos right. These things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. Now remember to each church Jesus is going back to his description that John how John described him in Revelation 1 as he would be coming in all of his glory. He takes one of those characteristics and focuses on it to each of the seven churches. So, in uh, Ephesus, he who holds the seven stars in his right hand. Per, uh, Smyrna, he the, who is the first and the last, who was dead and came to life. Now, he who has the sharp two-edged sword. Verse 13, I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. Um, Smyrna had a synagogue of Satan. Now, Pergamos has his throne. And so we're going to escalate even in the next church. You hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith even in the days in which Antipas, my faithful martyr who was killed among you where Satan dwells. Nevertheless, but I have a few things against you because you hold those, uh, you, you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to stumble, a stumbling block before the children of, of Israel to eat things, sacrifice to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. So we hear them again. They were in Ephesus. 
and they are now in Pergamos. You remember, Jesus uses some real strong language about these groups. This is what he thinks of false doctrine, which things I hate. Repent or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to him who overcomes. I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. I will give him a white stone and on the stone a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. So in your notes, we're going to look at the approval real quickly. Uh, called the greatest city in Asia Minor, Pergamos is the compromising church. Pergamos had the first temple dedicated to a Caesar, was an avid promoter of the imperial cult. Their city also had a temple dedicated to a big god that I never can pronounce the name right, but the god of healing, and uh, which insignia was the entwined serpent on a staff. Uh, Pergamos is also known, famous for their libraries, their theater. They actually at this time had a, a Pergamos, in Pergamos, and actually developed a parchment for writing. So the city was one of the uh, central hubs for education, and they were moving from, um, from animal skins to parchments and different things. So Pergamos was very influential. And in your notes, they had some approval. Uh, they had those that hold fast the name of Christ. Uh, they had refused to drop incense on the altar or to light a candle and say, Caesar is Lord. Okay, so they had some things going right for them. They were willing to die for their faith. That don't get much better than that. All right, they had a pastor. His name was Antimus, the pastor of Pergamus. He, by the way, um, for all of my folks who say that we should not be involved in politics, you will not defend that scripturally. There is no such thing as separation of church and state. There is separation of state, but the church is to be involved in any and everything. And we must speak out against what is false. And when someone stands up and says that they they uh, they uh, um, running on campaigns that they believe that abortion would be unchristian if we don't allow it to happen, I've got to stand up and say, there's Jezebel. You'll meet Jezebel next week at Thyatira, all right? She was married to Ahab. I'll let you do your own analogy on who Jezebel and Ahab are in this nation. We've had a couple of sets of them as presidents and first ladies. You're welcome, okay? So understand, Antipas denounced emperor worship. He would not bow a knee to Caesar. He was placed in a brazen bull set on fire, and he burned to death for his faith. So understand, he, he refused when the federal government said, you're going to say that Caesar is Lord. He refused to do it. He spoke out on that uh, issue, and uh, again, it cost him his life. So understand, they had a good heritage. Antipas was a faithful pastor. He had led them not only into truth, but had to lead them tragically by example. And sometimes you have to stand for your faith. And so understanding that, um, there is secondly then an accusation. Satan had not been able to destroy the church by coming to them as a roaring lion, a lion and, uh, as 1 Peter 5, 8 says. But he was making inroads as a deceiving serpent. A group of compromising people had infiltrated the fellowship, and Jesus Christ hated their doctrines and their practices. Now, it's interesting that we have the first reference to one of two groups. One was those who had the doctrine of Balaam. The second were the Nicolaitans. We've talked about Nicolaitans. We'll talk about them again just in brief review of who they were. But now we have Balaam mentioned. Now, in your notes, I noted for you, there are three mentions of Balaam in the New Testament. So when God uses an Old Testament false prophet three times in the New Testament, hello, you better wake up because this is a serious thing. And so in your notes, there are three times that Balaam is mentioned in the New Testament. Number one, 
it, it, the doctrine there is referred to as the way of Balaam in your notes in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 15 and 16. Here's what it says. They have forsaken the right way and gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. And he was rebuked for his iniquity. A dumb donkey speaking with a man's voice restrained, listen, the madness of the prophet. Now, I didn't say it. God's word said it. When you denounce false prophets, you denounce them. You don't compromise with them. And so there was a way that Balaam taught. And he, he taught that, uh, as John said in 1 John chapter 2, that in the last day, there would be many come to you in the church who would make merchandise of you. So they're in it for the wrong motive, and they're in it to get rich quick. And you can find that all over the churches of the United States of America today by those who have been deceived through this ungodly health, wealth, and prosperity theology that's out there. It is absolute blasphemous. Uh, listen, most foreign countries have it. We've got one of the most noted ones in the United States. You know, he has like 25 countries he's not even allowed to land his plane in. He has caused so much havoc and so much trouble in those countries, they won't even let him land at their airport. And if I say something about him, I'll get hate mail. I don't care. You got somebody's got to get a streak of yellow out of them and stand up and be a man. And these guys are false prophets and they're deceiving this nation. Go, Pastor. All right, now. There's the way of Balaam. Number two, listen to Jude 11. There is the error of Balaam. Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. They have run greedily in the error of Balaam for profit and perished in the rebellion of Coram, or Korah. So it starts out as a way, then it enters in as an error of what he taught. And basically, let's just review. Balaam taught two things. Uh, he took money from a Moabite's king named Balak. And Balak hired him to curse Israel. Problem was, he tried it three times and couldn't do it. Every time he opened his mouth, God took a hold of his vocal cords and he gave some of the greatest blessings he could probably possibly do on the children of Israel. And Balak just had a cow over here. And so he paid him more money. Opened his mouth second time. Nothing come out but blessings. Did it a third time. Third time, God talked to the guy through a donkey to try and stop him, and he didn't get his attention. If your donkey starts talking to you, listen. It's the first time in all of history a jackass talked to a... You fill it in. A donkey. So understand, he does it a third time, David, and just blesses Israel everywhere. All right? He couldn't do it. He went to Balaam and said, listen, don't matter how much money you give me, I can't curse these people. But I can tell you how you'll get them. Oh, well, Balaam walked through the camp of the Moabites and saw all them beautiful women. And he said, you get, you get them beautiful women over to the camp of Israel, you'll get them. I guarantee you'll get them. You send them over there, and I guarantee you they're going to succumb to that temptation, and you're going to defile their nation, and you'll destroy them from within. And that is, friend, exactly what happened to Israel. So you got the way, the error, and now in and the Pergamus, it's now a doctrine being taught. And what's being taught? It's okay. It's okay to participate in the festivals at Pergamus, down at the medical center. It's okay to go down there and, and uh, you know, get involved in all of the temple prostitution, both male and female. It's okay to do those kind of different things. Listen, there's nothing wrong with, uh, with uh 
participating in the sacrificing to idols. And the Nicolaitans would come along and say, now listen, everything's okay. It does, don't get involved in the politics. It's really not going to hurt to go down and bow a knee to Caesar and drop a little bit of incense or burn a little candle. There's no, you're going to be a patriot. You're going to be a real good citizen. You don't have to do anything. Listen, don't listen to what Antipas and other people are telling you. And Jesus would look at you and I and say, I tell you, I hate it. It is no longer the, the Satan has his throne here. And you never compromise with satanic doctrine. Revelation 2.14, I have a few things against you. You hold them. Now, there are three types of the will of God, and for the sake of time, I'm not going to get to them today. I'm going to give them to you, though. In Balaam's life, there was a directive will of God. God tried to reach Balaam. I just want you to understand what he tries to do with all false prophets, false teachers. He really loves them and tries to reach them. And uh, he, th there was a directive will of God. You will not, Numbers 22, 15 says, Balaam, you will not go with them. You shall not curse the people, for they are blessed. God moved on with Balaam, still trying to reach him, and said, listen. And God came to Balaam at night and said, if the men come to you, rise, go with them, but do not speak a word unless I tell you to speak it. Now, he told him not to go. Balaam's going anyway. God said, listen, I'll go with you. I'll, I'm trying my best to draw you to me. And finally, there's the overriding will. Balaam said, uh, it doesn't matter what God says. I'm going to curse these people. And God overruled him and would not allow him. Balaam had a doctrine that said, if you can't beat them, join them. That was his doctrine. If you can't beat them, join them. Get them Moabite ladies over there. Hey, get them some, uh, get you a, a website and put their images on that website and you'll get them. They, they will not be able to resist clicking that button. They will not be able to resist Roku TV. They will not be able to resist. You put it on there, I guarantee you, I'll never forget 1969. Are you listening? 1969, I'm a teenage young man raised in an ultra charismatic church. Man, we didn't believe in nothing. Everybody all right? I mean, uh, you couldn't even go to the picture show. Couldn't go see the Ten Commandments at the drive-in theater when it came out. I'm just talking, we had to roller skate to gospel music. You can't get your groove on to Amazing Grace. I'm sorry. It's something like slow dancing with your gal to Amazing Grace. It just kind of takes all the mood out of it. Am I right? Big old, big old heifer on the stage, big old fat guy. And he's up there denouncing everything. And I'm thinking, well, the reason you don't roller skate because you got your big twinkie butt out there, you'd kill yourself. That's what I'm thinking as a 13-year-old kid. Now, I'm telling you the truth. But here's a statement he made. He said, I'm telling you now, if we don't get serious in this nation, they're going to be pumping X-rated pornography into our homes, and we're going to pay them to do it. And I said, oh, man, we get this guy out of here. This guy's a nut. This guy don't know what he's talking about. Hey, Father, forgive me. Stupid is, stupid does. Everybody okay? So sometimes the voice of a prophet comes from uncharted waters or something you don't want even want to hear or don't believe could even happen to your nation. And yet we are in grip with it today. We're a nation that is beset by it today. In your notes, the name Pergamos, by the way, means married. Reminding us that each local church is engaged to Christ and must be kept pure. This church committed spiritual adultery. Now, I said this church is rampant in the United States of America today. Let me prove my point, if I can take just a moment to do so. On screen, we're going to walk through just several facts. These aren't things that I make up. These are the most recent facts that I could download from all of the info being done by our folks at uh, Ethics and Religious Life Committee of Southern Baptist Convention. The primary stronghold on our churches today is pornography. Porn sites receive more traffic than Amazon and Twitter combined. Money spent by men on porn exceeds all revenue generated from rock music, country music, ballet, jazz, and Broadway shows combined. In 2017, the top porn site got 1,000 visits per second. 
and had 91 trillion 980 that's 91 billion 980 million 225,000 videos watched which was the equivalent of 12.5 videos for each person on the planet more than 4 million 599,000 hours of porn were watched on this one site in one year 79% of 18 to 30-year-old men watch porn at least once a month. 67% of 31 to 40-year-olds. 50% of 50 to 68-year-old men do the same. 56% of all divorces involve one person having an addiction to porn. Porn is the silent epidemic. You'll see more material on this coming out within the walls of our churches. This is by study by SBC Churches, by the way. A five-year study revealed that 68% of Christian men and 50% of pastors view porn at minimum on a monthly basis. The greatest users are teenage boys, which means that when these boys become adults, the church will be flooded with porn addicts. 50% of the men sitting in our churches on Sunday mornings are addicted to porn. It is estimated that a third of all of our pastors are porn addicts. 80% of young pastors and 37% of older pastors admit to struggling with porn. Our North American Mission Board is no longer asking, do you view pornography, but now is asking, when was the last time you viewed pornography on their applications for a missionary? Balaam has infiltrated the churches of America. If these are true by the, about the SBC, and, and you may not know this or not, uh, you, I, many of you do, I'm sure, but many people look to the SBC um, as the rock, the foundation, that if you want to see a denomination that's doing it right, and then they're per nobody's perfect, but when it comes to people finding Christ and sending missionaries around the world and doing all these things, they, they use the SBC as a launching pad and as an example. And if this is happening in our churches today, if this has infiltrated us to this level, is it any wonder why Life Action was here this week? Why they hit so hard on honesty and holiness and obedience and you fill in the blank. Now, I'm going to come back to this. I've got to close the message because of the sake of the Scripture. But let's close with the admonition given. Again, Antipas had felt the sword of Rome, but the church would feel the sword of Christ if they didn't repent. That simple. Um, but John, uh, as he does with all of the churches of Revelation, there's a promise given. And the promise is given to the overcomer. And we've studied who the overcomer is many, many times in here. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcomes the world? But he that believes that Jesus is the Son of God. John wrote that in his first short little email that he sent out in chapters 5, verses 4 and 5. Now, the promise given to this church, as well as to any church, for the overcomers that are there, because all of the church is not infiltrated with it, in Thyatira, he's going to say this, even in this place, there are people who have not compromised their name. So in every church, there are still people doing it right, and there are still people that are holding to the truth. But in Pergamos and Thyatira, they were very much in the minority. But to him who overcomes, I, I will give him some of the hidden manna to eat. Manna represented the daily fellowship with the Lord. Manna represented his word, not just uh, something that he could float down from heaven in several miles that they could go out and pick each day. Manna, we'll spend a message in the future just on manna and what it symbolized in Scripture. It's interesting, it's called a hidden manna because um, the word hidden there means things that aren't revealed yet. You will learn, and there are many things that we'll not learn on this side till we get to the other side. 
So understand, there are some things that are go we're going to learn on the other side. Uh, some of maybe the questions of why God does this and why God allows this to happen. I don't know. I grew up singing an old song that says, we'll understand it better by and by. Trials dark on every hand, we cannot understand all the ways that God would lead us to his blessed promised land. But he, we're guided with his light. We'll follow till we die. We'll understand it better by and by. By and by, when the morning comes, when all the saints of God are gathered home, we'll tell the story how we overcome, and we'll understand it better by and by. So we're not only going to have the, the manna provided for us every day, which represented fellowship with him and his word, not just a material thing to eat. We'll have the hidden manna. We'll understand. And then secondly, he says, I'll give them a white stone. Now, that's the best I could do for a white stone that I could find. What does a white stone symbolize? I, I, I just mark some of these down. Uh, I'll use a couple that even young people will understand. A white stone is, first of all, used to cast a vote of favor for. It would be a black stone, a gray stone, and a white stone. White stone meant it was a, a vote of favor. I'll, I'll give him a white stone. White stone was also used for a dinner reservation. You made a dinner reservation. You'd go by and you'd pick up a white stone and uh, and uh, what, de depending on uh, when that was, you knew what time you were supposed to come back and dinner. And how'd you know you had a reservation? You brought the white stone that they gave you. And so we could symbolize a lot of things with that, but sake of time, we won't. It was used for a VIP list. Uh, hey, young people, it was used for a fast pass at Disneyland or Universal Studios. Do you ever get one of those? I bought one one year. I thought, I'm going to try this. I don't want to waste this much money, but man, it was like 9,750 people in one line, and we had about eight hours, and so I just went and purchased one. It was about 50 bucks a person for that day, and I didn't really care. And guess what? Man, my, my kids thought they were VIPs. They just, they quit whining and complaining, went right to the front line. You said you spoiled them? Well, yeah, that's what grandparents do. Come on, get with the program here. That's our job. Hey, it was also given as a VIP pass to a special theater events and attractions that would come into town. Um, it was used for an acquittal vote in a court of law. And let's put it in terms we would understand. Uh, you could get a presidential pardon if they brought you a white stone. You understand you've been given a pardon by the king of kings and lord of lords. Not no earthly potentate, but the king of kings and lord of lords has pardoned you. He's giving you a white stone. By the way, when you get that white stone from Jesus, it's got to have a new name on it. You know, I, I've read, I, I don't know, I probably read, Tony, I don't know, maybe 15 commentaries on that, and about 12 of them were dumb enough to try to explain what that name was. Now listen, here's what Scripture says. A new name that nobody knows, and the only body that's going to know it is the guy who gets it. So, ain't nobody knows, but what, I don't know what it might say on mine. It might say dork. <laughs> okay? I have no idea. It, might, it could be a reference to character. It could be a reference to testimony. It could, all I know is you, got, you want to make sure you get one of these. Because when you get one of these, you're in. And in eternity past, Jesus cast a white stone in your favor. Jesus said, I'll go, Father, I'll go to the cross and die for them so that if they'll believe in me, they will be saved. And he cast a white stone in your favor. In eternity past, he did it when you were his enemy because he loved you and he cared for you. Now, guys, let's go back to the real problem in Pergamos. Put that list back up there for me, guys, if you will. Maybe I, I pray that every man in here today this is not an issue with him. This is what I pray. But ladies, here's your part. I'm going to challenge you today, ladies. If your guy won't let you do it, it's a pretty good sign he's got some problems. All right? Here's my challenge to you. I don't know what kind of cable you got. I don't know what kind of TV set you got, what kind of TV system you've got. But gentlemen, you need to give your wife permission to go home today and put a passcode on there that only she knows. So you'll cut that junk out of your life. Only she knows. And you'll cut it out of your life. Everybody okay? Y'all all right? 
See, I almost catch myself stopping doing that nowadays because of the T-shirt with my face on it says that. <laughs> so I just want to encourage you. Uh, let's get proactive. They talked about taking steps of obedience. And so maybe, maybe that's the first step. But it's a step. It's one step in the right direction. Hey, if you got a problem with this stuff, listen, I existed for several years on this planet without one of these. Okay? And I'll be daggone. Now, I don't have my cell phone in my pocket. I, if I didn't exist a lot of years on the planet without that demon-possessed cell phone over there. Okay? And so let me say it again. I've said it recently, but let me say it again. Gentlemen, if you get a Facebook request from a young lady, she doesn't want to be your friend. She wants to be your fantasy. And so be very, very careful what you're doing out there, or you're going to become a casualty right here. Okay? Now, here's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to set the example for it, and I'm going to, we're going to do this as men today. All right? If you don't want to participate, that's fine. There's no guilt in that if you don't feel comfortable in participating. But here's how we're going to participate today. Jim, Jim Gray's chairman of the deacons. Dave is my worship pastor right here. Every week on Sunday when we walk in here, we're going to ask each other this question. Are you clean today? Are you, have you watched anything that disqualifies you this week that you need to repent over? So, Jim, Dave, you got permission. Hopefully, I've got it in your life. And so, guys, I'm telling you, if we're going to be, if we're going to get this junk out of our churches and have a church that's marching forward for the cause of Jesus Christ, we have got to take action and stop talking about it. Because talk is cheap. Jesus, as the Word said, through Jesus, which it's the mind of Christ, said this. Let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And I'm telling you, I know there are guys that battle this here. I would never point you out, but I know you are. Okay? I've shared with you my struggle. There are times I have to turn commercials. Everybody okay? When I'm watching a stinking football game and I got to turn commercials. So trust me, I didn't get spayed and neutered. I'll let you figure that out for yourself. Our director of missions is sitting in the back. He's going to, uh, this is going to go all over Cincinnati Association right now. Guys, I want you to join me at the altar. Come on. We're going to do a little different invitation this morning. We've been doing different ones for the last four or five nights. When we're done today, I'm going to be right down here in the front as I always am. If you're here today and you prayed to receive Christ, I'm going to ask you to join me there. And we're, we're going to, I'm going to rejoice with you. If you want to know how to find Christ, I want you to meet me there. But I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit of God convicted my heart on this as much as he's done anything. Come on down, guys. Honker in. Scoot in here. Get in as close as you can. We're going to do this in the next service. I'm not picking on you all. See, I just looked up there. We're an older group here, so at least we're in better percentage <laughs> than them younger ones in that next service. Lord, have mercy. I have four. I got 80% of the church in the next service battling with this. According to that, I only got 50% in this one. I hope and pray those statistics are wrong at Urban Crest. But I'm telling you, we're men, and we better be on the watch because the enemy's plan for our marriage is to kill, to steal, and to destroy. And he will do it. Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to turn around in groups of three, find three guys. Okay, Jim, you're already with me. Dave, you're with me. You're my three. Find three guys. You may not even know them. Uh, everybody get in a huddle of three. Three guys. What's the Bible say? A threefold cord is not easily broken, right? So who needs a third one? Bob out there on the end. There's two guys out there. Go join them two guys right there. Everybody in groups of three. You say, I don't even know these guys. That's even better. You can be honest with them. Okay? Now, every Sunday when we come in here, or every time you even walk by these guys, I want you to ask each other a question. Are you clean? Are you clean? I ain't talking about taking a bath or a shower. I'm talking about, are you clean? All right, is there anything? Now, what do, you, what do you do? You can either lie, or you can say, man, would you pray with me real quick? i got to confess something to the Lord. And here's what the Bible says. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and he'll do what? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Top our head, sole of our foot, he'll cleanse us from all unrighteousness.